All right, then. Welcome back to our uh, second Tuesday video lecture, um, where we left off was discussing the concept of concentrations in chemistry. Concentrations are very important because they tell you the relative amount of stuff that's dissolved in water to make a solution, or at least that's how concentrations are most commonly used in general chemistry. And a lot of what we use in general chemistry are, is chemicals in the form of solutions. So knowing concentrations and how to deal with them is, is very important. And the most important uh, way to do concentration of all, if for general chemistry anyway, is molarity. And we went over that last time. Uh, molarity is moles of solute uh, divided by the volume of the solution in liters. And that's a very handy way to uh, do things. Also, uh, we went over dilutions, uh, where you can um, find out you take a certain you know solution with a certain volume and you dilute it up to a certain new volume. What would the what would the new concentration be, and so on and so forth. So um, dilutions are also very important to do because they're the kind of things that we actually have to do quite a lot in general chemistry especially me as the instructor, I have to dilute solutions when we're meeting in person anyway, all the time to make the solutions that you use in, in lab. Uh, so this equation is one that I use all the time. <clears throat> and it's very useful for class too. So any, anybody studying chemistry should definitely know how to use this equation. Uh, remember, as we mentioned before, we use the formula M1V1 equals M2V2. The concentration doesn't necessarily have to be in units of molarity though. Um, because they're, you know, the, the equation works for most units of concentration, actually. And also, the volume does not necessarily have to be in liters. It can be in any volume units you want. It's just that V1 and V2 have to be in the same units. So you could use milliliters, uh, like we did in this equation here, actually. And um, that just means that if you're looking for V2, that's going to come out in milliliters. So it's a very versatile equation. <clears throat> Moving on, um, we need to go over a few other units of concentration. These units of concentration won't be used nearly as often as molarity is in general chemistry, but we do need to be aware of them and, and what they mean. Uh, because actually, for one thing, even though a lot of these units of concentration, like the first one we're going to go over, mass percentage, is not used in chemistry all that often, it is used quite often for things like consumer products. So it's uh, good that you have an idea what it means. Uh, one of the reasons that we want to uh, talk about other concentration units is the molarity is affected by temperature. And so just as a quick aside, the reason that molarity can be affected by temperature is that um, it contains, it, a part of the equation for molarity is volume of solution. <clears throat> so change in the temperature won't affect the number of moles of solute present in the solution, but it will affect the volume of the solution. If the temperature goes up significantly, then the volume of the solution will go up significantly and the molarity will go down. So if temperature goes up, the number of liters will go up and the molarity will go down. If temperature goes down, you know, things generally contract, get smaller as, as they get colder. And the same is true of solutions. <clears throat> generally the volume of water and water-based solutions will contract as the temperature goes down. And the result is since um, volume in liters is in the denominator, the effect on molarity will be the opposite. The molarity will go up. So the molarity changes in um, a direction opposite that of temperature. The change is not usually huge uh, unless the change in temperature is really huge. Uh, so for you know most temperatures, most reasonable temperatures, say room temperature, whether it's say 65 or 70 or even 75 Fahrenheit, uh, you can still use molarity and it'll be uh, consistent enough uh, that you can get away with it. But if the temperatures vary a lot, then um, 
you're going to have to uh, maybe think about some other unit for concentration. And so that's where that brings us to where we are right now. <clears throat> One unit that's often useful if you're dealing with solids, you know, say a um, say for instance an alloy like for instance brass, which is essentially a solid solution. Brass um, is made up, uh, I think I mentioned before, of about 85% copper and about 15% um, zinc. And that is actually percentage by mass. So if, if you take this key and weigh it and find out what the weight is, then you can be reasonably sure that about 85% of that weight is due to the copper that's in it. And about 15% of the weight is due to the zinc that's in it. <clears throat> because percentages for alloys are normally done as mass percentages. Uh, generally, when we're speaking about um, uh, percentages, in very general terms, remember percent is generally the part you're interested in over the whole thing times 100. And in this case, the part we're interested in will usually be a solute, but it could be a solvent. And then the whole thing would be the entire sample or the entire solution. <clears throat> uh, so for mass percent, more formally, it would be equal to the mass of the component of interest, that is the com part of the mixture that you're interested in, divided by the total mass of the solution or the sample times 100. And uh, the component of interest could be solute or solvent. I'm going to underline solute because it's usually the solute that you're interested in when you uh, talk about mass percentages, but not always. Like, for instance, for the uh, brass uh, key that I mentioned. In brass, there are really, um, well, in simple brasses, there are actually various brasses where the percentages vary a little bit, and sometimes even other stuff creeps into the mixture. But in the simplest form of brass, it's nothing but copper and zinc. Those two things mixed homogeneously together as liquids, you know, molten liquids, and then cooled into a solid. And since there are only two components in it, the one that's present in larger amounts is generally considered to be the solvent and the one that would be the copper. And the one that's present in smaller amounts, the zinc, is generally considered to be the solute. But, uh, and, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you could do percentage for either one of those. 85% copper, that's the solvent. 15% zinc, that's the solute. Um, and there could be more than one solute, uh, but there, by definition, there's only one solvent in each solution. Uh, so like um, steel, for example. Steel is, is um, mostly based on iron, so iron would be the solvent. And there are a lot of other stuff or a lot of other things that can be put into steel, uh, chromium, molybdenum, nickel, carbon even, um, and other stuff like that. Even so, you mix them together when they're molten liquids, let it cool down and you get a homogeneous mixture. So that is technically a solution, but it's a solution with several different solvents. Or for that matter, just something simple like um, water. You could dissolve salt in water, and then you have water as the solvent and salt as the solute. But there's no reason that you couldn't take that salt water and then dissolve some sugar in it. So water would be the solvent, and salt and sugar would both be solutes. <clears throat> uh, OK, so the mass percents of all the components always have to total up to 100%. That's just the nature of percents. They always total up to 100 if you're counting everything. And so that can be handy to know because it can save you some time sometimes when trying to find out the percents of the components of everything in a mixture. Again, if we go back to brass um, and you know that the brass, it consists of copper and zinc and it's 15% by mass zinc, what's the percentage of the copper? 85% because it's 100 minus 15. <clears throat> um, and uh, like I said, it's often used for consumer products like uh, for instance, vinegar is usually the legal um, specification for vinegar is uh, that I believe it has to be somewhere between about three and 5% acetic acid by mass. And uh, you'll find out, you know, if you can do tests on it to make sure, and that usually does come out in that range. 
Bleach is about seven and a half percent sodium hypochlorite, that's NaClO, by mass. And we can work out some problems with uh, mass percent. For example, if a 5.2 gram sample of vinegar contains point, uh, put a zero in front of it just to be formal, 0 0.245 grams acetic acid, what is the weight percent of acetic acid in the vinegar? And um, so keep in mind that the vinegar, now sometimes in, in um, situations like this, you have to be careful. Well, you actually, you always have to be careful, but sometimes it can be a little challenging to determine. Um, you have to be able to distinguish between whether you're talking about the entire solution or just the solvent. So the information we're given here, 5.2 grams uh, sample of vinegar, that would be the entire solution, not, ju not just the solvent. The solvent in vinegar is water. So when we say 5.2 grams, that's, e that's the whole solution. That's everything. Within that solution, we have 0.245 grams of acetic acid. That's the solute. So what is the percent or the weight percent acetic acid in the vinegar? Well, it's the part we're interested in, the acetic acid over the whole thing, the vinegar times 100. <clears throat> okay, so that would be 0.245 grams over 5.2 grams times 100, and we get 4.7%. So it is within the legal range for, uh, for vinegar. The bottle, uh, for another example, a bottle of bathroom cleaner contains 135 grams of hydrochloric acid and 775 grams of water. What is the mass percent of hydrochloric acid in that solution? Now, in this case, you have to realize that the water is just the solvent. That's not the entire solution. Because water is not a solution. Water is a pure substance. So if you're mentioning, if, if the problem mentions water, now well, the water technically, I guess, could be a solute, but much more likely to be the solvent. But is, the water is definitely not the entire solution. And the hydrochloric acid would be the solute. And so in this case, the entire solution would actually be the hydrochloric acid and the water. So again, we for percentage, we take part over the whole times 100. That would be the mass of the HCl, the solute, over the mass of the whole solution, which is the 135 grams of hydrochloric acid over the whole solution, which is 775 for the H2O and 135 for the HCl. So that's 135 grams of HCl over 910 grams for the whole solution times 100 or 14.8%. Okay. So again, it's important to sort of think about what's being described. If it's water, then it can't be the whole solution. That would just be the solvent. Okay, um, another example, concentrated hydrochloric acid is a solution that is 37.2% by mass of hydrogen chloride gas dissolved in water. Its density is 1.19 grams per milliliter. So what volume of concentrated hydrochloric acid uh, solution uh, is what I squeezed in there, will contain exactly 125 grams of hydrogen chloride. You have the stuff that you dissolve in the water, which is the solute. So in a question like this, um, you have to start out with what does 37.2% mean? 37.2% hydrochloric, or well, 37.2 hydrochloric acid means 37.2% hydrogen chloride gas by mass. And that what that means is 37.2 grams HCl for every 100 grams of the solution. It's not per 100 grams of water. It's 100 grams of solution. The grams of water would be 100 minus 37.2. 
So if you need, or if you want to use 125 grams of HCl and 37.2 means 37.2 grams of HCl per 100 grams of solution, but it also means there are 100 grams of solution for every 37.2 grams of HCl, okay? So <clears throat> what this means is here uh, at this point, grams of HCl cancel with grams of HCl, and we would have the needed grams of the HCl solution that we need to use if we took 125 divided by 37.2, but we want grams. So what we do is we use the density. 1.19 grams per milliliter means that you need one milliliter of the solution for every 1.19 grams of the solution. So essentially we're dividing by the density here or technically multiplying by one over the density. And this way grams of solution will now cancel and we get milliliters of solution as the result. And it turns out that we need 282.4 or being strict about um, significant figures, 282 milliliters of the um, hydrochloric acid solution. That one was a little harder, definitely. But there are homework problems that'll help you uh, work that out. <clears throat> um, for volume percent, uh, it's similar to weight percent, but obviously it uses volumes. You can use any unit of volume. It doesn't have to be milliliters or liters. It could be cubic feet if you want it to be, uh, as long as you're using the same units for everything. You know, for the volumes of everything involved. Volume percent is used mostly for solutions uh, that use liquids as both solute or solvent, or sometimes gases as both solutes and solvents. Um, when we give the percentages of the various gases in air, that's that's volume percent. <clears throat> so, you know, the air is, is about 80% nitrogen. That means 80% of the volume of air is made up of nitrogen and about 20% of the volume of air is made up of oxygen. <clears throat> so for volume percent is still equal to the part we're interested in over the whole thing times 100, only it'll be volume units this time. So that would be the volume of the component of interest, which could be solute or solvent. When I say the air is 80% nitrogen or about 79% nitrogen actually, Nitrogen would be the solute because it's the stuff that's present in the largest, you know, largest quantities. And then, you know, about 20% oxygen. Oxygen is a solute because it's present in smaller quantities. And all mixtures of gases are always homogeneous mixtures. So all mixtures of gases, like the air, would count as solutions. <clears throat> um, so volume of component of interest divided by the total volume of the whole solution. Uh, and you just have to make sure that the volume units on the top and the bottom are the same times 100. Okay, so a uh, quick example of that. A 1.75 liter bottle of Scotch whiskey contains 752.5 milliliters of ethanol by volume. What is the volume percent of ethanol in the Scotch? First of all, as I mentioned, the volume units for the solution and the solute or the component of interest have to be the same. So here we've got uh, 1.75 liters of scotch versus 752.5 milliliters of ethanol. We have to make sure those units are the same. So it'd probably be easiest to change the 1.75 liters to milliliters. And you do that just by dividing or multiplying rather by a thousand and you get 1,750 milliliters of scotch for the entire thing. And then the volume of ethanol is already in milliliters, so that's ready to go. And uh, the volume percent of ethanol then will be the volume of ethanol over the volume of scotch times 100. And that's 752.5 milliliters over 1750 milliliters times 100 or 43%. Or in other words, 86 proof because the proof rating on liquor is um, the percentage times two. An 86 proof is the standard proof for Scotch whiskey, at least in the US. <clears throat> On the other hand, we could do uh, 
other things with this. Uh, for example, a 100 proof bottle of vodka. I don't know why I'm on the alcohol binge <laughs> for these examples at the moment, but um, bear with me. A 100 proof bottle of vodka contains 50% by volume ethanol. Uh, and again, the, the proof is just the percentage by volume ethanol times two. So if it's 100 proof, that means 50%. Um, if the um, density of the ethanol is 0.7895 grams per milliliter, I wrote it over here more clearly. How many grams of ethanol are present in a 750 milliliter bottle of vodka of the 100 proof variety? <clears throat> okay, uh, again, in this case, if you want, um, if you're given a percentage and you want a specific mass, the first thing you really need to consider is what does the percentage mean? Uh, just like the uh, example of the concentrated HCL that we did a few minutes ago. So 50% by volume means there are 50 milliliters, and I was reverting back to mass, so I wrote grams by mistake, so forget that, but 50 milliliters of ethanol for every 100 milliliters of the vodka. <clears throat> And vodka is essentially pretty much just uh, ethanol and water. And um, so most, well, so basically it would be 50 milliliters of ethanol and 50 milliliters of water make up the 100 milliliters of vodka. Um, 750 milliliters of vodka times the fact that there are 50 milliliters of ethanol for every 100 milliliters of vodka means that milliliters of vodka will cancel out. And at this point, we would have the volume of ethanol in that 750 milliliters of vodka. 750 times 50 divided by 100 would give you the volume of ethanol present in that bottle of vodka. But we wanted mass. So that's where the density comes in. The density, uh, basically we, we would have milliliters of ethanol here. And that means that we want milliliters of ethanol to cancel out. So you can use the density as it is, 0.7895 grams of ethanol for every one milliliter of ethanol. Milliliters of ethanol will cancel. And then when you multiply this times this divided by this times this, you get 296 grams of ethanol. Okay, so that's how much ethanol would be present by mass in that bottle of vodka. All right, we also uh, have mass volume percentages. And that would be the mass of the solute divided by the volume of the solution times 100. Uh, and the units for the numerator and denominator can vary. Uh, for instance, saline solution uh, mass volume percent is given as grams of NaCl divided by the volume of the solution in milliliters times 100. That's used for some um, medical related stuff like, for instance, saline solution. That's usually the concentration of that is usually given in mass volume percentage. And then we also have parts per million and parts per billion, <clears throat> which are often used for things that are present in smaller amounts. Uh, parts per million and parts per billion are essentially the same thing as mass percent, except you multiply by a different number after taking the part you're interested in divided by the whole thing. Uh, parts or percentage is essentially the same as, or I mean, parts per, uh, sorry, per, uh, percentage is essentially parts per hundred. You can think of percentage as literally being parts per hundred. Uh, and so uh, that's literally what percent means from Latin. Uh, per cent means per 100. Centum is the Latin word for 100. And so percent means parts per hundred. And so you take the part you're interested in divided by the whole thing times hundred. Well, for parts per million, you take the parts or the part you're interested in divided by the whole thing times a million. And for parts per billion, you take the part you're interested in divided by the whole thing times a billion. Or a little more formally, uh, parts per million would be the mass of the component you're interested in divided by the mass of the whole solution times a million or 10 to the sixth. Parts per billion would be the same thing, only times 10 to the ninth or a billion. 
Uh, just a quick example of um, parts per million, parts per billion calculations. If, say, a 10 milliliter sample of water contains 8.5 micrograms of lead, what would be the concentration of the lead in parts per million and parts per billion? <clears throat> well, let's see. Parts per million would be the mass of the part we're interested in, which would be the lead. 8.5 micrograms. Remember, micro means 10 to the minus 6. So if it's 8.5 micrograms, that's just 8.5 times 10 to the minus 6 grams. Divided by 10 grams of water, which would, the water, it, well, when I said water, I said it would never be the whole solution. And actually, I kind of lied. Um, in kind of the chemistry lab situation, where we're doing experiments in the lab, water is just a pure substance. But in this case, the water refers to a sample of water that you took out in nature. So say maybe groundwater. And so water as we encounter it out in the wild, you know, outside the chemistry lab, or even tap water in a chemistry lab is actually a solution. And we can test for various things dissolved in that water. The distilled water that we use in the chemistry lab is pure water and well, maybe not totally 100% pure, but pure enough that we can consider it to be a pure substance. But in this case, say this was groundwater, so it's actually got stuff dissolved in it. And so that would be, so the water actually would be considered the whole solution, the whole sample. So 8.5 times 10 to the minus six grams of lead for every 10 grams of groundwater times a million would give you 0 0.85 parts per million of lead. And that's why we use parts per million for stuff like this, because there's not a lot of lead present. And we hope there is not a lot of lead present, because lead's pretty nasty stuff to have in your water. And so uh, it came out to be 0.85 parts per million lead. And parts per million just is a small enough unit that it gives us a convenient size number to deal with um, when dealing with stuff that's present in only small amounts. You could look at it also in parts per billion. Parts per billion is usually used for stuff that's present in even smaller amounts than this. And so you'll get a bigger number out of parts per billion. It's the same thing though, 8.5 times 10 to the minus six grams of lead divided by the 10 grams of groundwater times a billion. And you end up with 850 parts per billion. Still a pretty reasonable number to deal with. The reason that we don't use percentage for stuff that's present in very small amounts, although you could, but the reason we generally don't is because it gives you a really, really small number. So just for comparison, this same sample in percentage would be 8.5 times 10 to the minus 6 grams of lead over 10 grams of groundwater times 100 would give you 0.0000850% lead. And that is a number that is kind of a lot uh, harder to understand at a glance, a lot harder to deal with than 0.85 or even 850. Okay, so that's why we generally don't use percentage for stuff that's present only in very small amounts. We have one more uh, concentration uh, to go over before the end of the chapter, uh, but I need to leave that for the next segment. So I'll see you in a minute with that.